Jesus would complete what Moses started. How does a holy God live among a really rebellious bunch of people? But if he didn't rise from the dead, what good is it? From morning to night, Jesus thinks about you. Um, my name is Jerry, and that's all the information you get. Last name's a little bit too personal. And so maybe, maybe in the future, I'll give you that part. We've been doing Shadows of Christ. Uh, you know the mantra by now. Every character, every event throughout the entire scriptures from Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament, they're all about Jesus. It's not just Jesus happens to be uh, somehow mentioned or foreseen, but the, the, the fullest meaning is always going to Jesus. The story of Jesus drives the biblical narrative from Genesis on. So today, as we've been moving, last week was Joseph. And those four guys had like 800 chapters to work through. I think it was 12 chapters, 37 to 50. So 13 chapters or 49 maybe. Um, today we're doing Moses and we're just doing one little part, his birth. I'm gonna jump it a little further than that, but we're gonna start with his birth. Of all the characters in the Old Testament, we would argue that every character in some way points to Jesus. And so by the time that Jesus comes, regardless of where you've read in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, you've, you've had a glimpse of who Jesus is, who this person, you may not know his name, but you know he's coming and you know what he's going to be like, at least it's at, at some level. Well, with Moses, it's the most clear presentation of Jesus from birth to life. A hundred years ago, a British theologian, A.W. Pink, he listed 75 comparisons between Jesus and Moses. I was going to preach on them, but I figured that'd be a, take us till to tomorrow. So we're going to look at the birth, and here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to rehearse how the birth of Jesus is mirrored in the birth of Moses. Secondly, two ways in which Jesus fulfills the ministry of Moses. And then finally, we're going to look at three applications. So there's going to be four comparisons, two ways he fulfills, and three applications. Can you tell I'm the type of guy that when I lock my door, I go back and check it six times? Uh, I like to have numbers, and that way, if you need to keep up, you know where we're going. So let's pray, and we'll do this. Now, I'm glad you're here. And what's interesting, you don't have to close your eyes yet and pray, but what's interesting is if you're here, it's because God's brought you, me included. And God's brought us that he might speak to us. Uh, and so the prayer is that even in what I say, but the people next to you, God's placed you even there, so look at them and be nice. Uh, let's pray that the Spirit of God may change our hearts. There may be some of you in here today who don't know Jesus, and you're just asking questions. Is this any good? It's all about Jesus, and so let's pray. Father, may we center in even now our attention spans aren't always the greatest. We've got a lot going on. There are some in here who have had a very harried week. There are some coming in this morning who carry burdens, and their minds keep going back to those. There are some who are looking at this next week, and they don't do so with much joy. And then we have the other side those who have seen you deliver them last week or expecting that this next week. And Father, we have some in here who probably don't know you, who have never met Jesus. And so we pray you'll, your spirit will move in our hearts. May we just enjoy each other because we're all participants in this thing. You are the audience of one. It's about you, not about us. And so may you... Work in our hearts and be pleased in us through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. The passage we're going to look at today is going to be Exodus 2, page 79. So if you'd like to get that out, or put another way, get that out. Or another way, please get that out. Or a fourth way, do whatever you want. Exodus 2, we're going to read the first 10 verses. That is the recounting of his birth. Before that, 
If you do have your Bibles, you want to look or you just want to listen, let me give you a recap of Exodus chapter 1. Remember how 50 ends? Uh, we've got the, 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 the tribe, uh, Jacob's descendants, his sons, who become the tribes of Israel. They have moved to Egypt because of the famine. And so they're there now. And as we move to chapter 1 in Exodus, it picks up that story. Verses 1 through 5, 70 people in the family of Jacob head south. That includes Joseph, who's already there, and his sons. They go down to Egypt. Um, verses 6 through 7, Joseph and his brothers all die. And the generations then pass. Jacob's descendants expand. And the text says there are numerous amount of the children of Jacob. Uh, they're called Hebrews. You can call them Israelites. Both works, words work. Verse 8, a new pharaoh. If you read the history of Egypt, you'll see that different factions sort of take over. Well, a new pharaoh comes into power. And he doesn't know anything about Joseph. Verses 9 through 14, he sees all these people that are foreigners. And it scares him. If they wanted, he thinks, they could take over. And so he has them become slaves. Be interesting to see how this process worked, but they now begin to toil in the fields. He has them construct buildings, and the NIV says he worked them ruthlessly. Then in verses 15 to 22, that wasn't enough. And so this Pharaoh decided to do a two-step process of genocide. First, the midwives, the Hebrew midwives were instructed that if a male was born to any of these slaves, Hebrew slaves, they were to take them and kill them. But the midwives refused to do this. They couldn't openly say we refuse. But what they said when they were questioned why babies were still being born, boys, they said, oh, oh uh, the, these women are too fast, and, and, and they give birth before we can get there. And so Pharaoh made a second step, and he said to all the Egyptians, if you see any male infants, Hebrew male infants, you have the state's permission to take them and throw them into the Nile. Mm. In the middle of this chaos, Moses was born. And so Exodus 2, 1 through 10, if you'll read with me, now we have the story of his birth. So now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Uh-oh. When she saw that he was a fine child, the word is really he, he's a healthy child. He's going, he's going to make it. She hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him. Coated, with, coated it with tar and pitch, and she placed a child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister, this is going to be Miriam, who we hear about later, she stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. Her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying. And she felt sorry for him. The word is she felt compassion for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, who had been hiding, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Oh, it's so cool. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. Getting paid to nurse her own son. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. His name was probably Ramoz, which is the name of Pharaoh's father, and Moses is probably a nickname. So here's where we begin. Already in the birth of Moses, as we look at this, we're going to see that God is announcing Jesus. Now, let, let's do this a second. What's the big deal about Jesus? And the answer is yes. The only thing that matters in this life of any real consequence is, do you know Jesus? The only thing as we move from this life to the next life 
that will matter is, do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and God knowing that as he wrote this revelation, embedded within the story from first to last, this person, Jesus, so that we wouldn't miss it. And so here we're going to see that the birth of Moses is pointing to the birth of Jesus because that's the birth that really matters. God is announcing the birth of Jesus. The movement of this story then is pretty clear. With the help of a Hebrew midwife, uh, Moses' mom gives birth to him, and she hides him. Wouldn't you love to know more about this story? Like, where did she hide him? How did she hide him? Did he cry at night? Like, wh- what's the cover-up? Were there people, Egyptian guards, walking through their area looking for babies? At three months old, she could no longer hide the child, so she took a woven basket, papyrus, off the side of of the, uh, the, the, the Nile River, and she made a basket and covered it to make it waterproof. Bitumen is what she used. It, th- that you would get it from the Dead Sea, so there, there must have been some sort of trade going to the Dead Sea getting this. It's the same material that you would use to wrap up a mummy. And so she mummified the outside of this little basket so that it would be waterproof. And then she took Moses to the edge of the river And she didn't take him and then just like push him out. See a kid. She placed him on the side. And she very specifically, let me show you here. You got, let's see here. There we go. These these are some reeds. Okay, I I will give you my my last name. My last name is Reed. Isn't it cool? My name's in the Bible and yours isn't. You're welcome. So she, she took her kid, little Moses, and put him in this little basket and put them along the side of the reed. You can walk along the Nile River. Has anyone been to the Nile? Have any of you gone? It's pretty cool, isn't it? Late at night, it's just an amazing place to be. Well, there she is, and she puts this, her, her little son right there. That, think, think how difficult that would have been. And she puts him there, and then Miriam watches. But she just doesn't put him anywhere. She puts Moses where she's convinced Pharaoh's daughter is going to find him. And what happens Exactly. She has the mom sense. Dads would have just thrown him out in the middle and said, yeah, he's got it. Um, And so he's there. And Pharaoh, when she goes to bathe, she sees this basket. And she tells one of her servant girls, go get this basket. And they bring it open. And she can hear the crying. And she opens it. There's this little baby. And she has compassion. The story could have ended right there, right? She could have said, nope. Notice the mom didn't take him to Pharaoh and say, here, Pharaoh, will you take care of my son? What she did is banked on the compassion. Either Pharaoh's daughter was already a mother or hoped to be a mother, and here was a baby. And so the story doesn't end there. She has compassion, and Miriam amazingly pops up from the reeds. And she said, would you like someone to nurse this child? And she said, yes, I'll pay you. And so the baby goes back home. That's amazing. Baby goes back home. But then, I haven't nursed in a long time, so I don't know why this is getting to me. Then the mom has to give her back, give him back. Can you imagine? Like, I just, I can't imagine at all that I, I, I'm not a mom. But to think about taking this child that you have saved, that you've done all this for, and then to say, take my kid. Like, how old was Moses? I mean, you, you'll hear stories, and like, I have kids who, who uh, grandparents and all were in Cuba before the revolution, and they'll talk about grandparents or maybe great grandparents nursing their children to age eight. So, can you imagine Moses' mom? Like, Moses is 30 years old, and he's saying, Mom, I'm done. And she says, No, because the moment I'm done nursing you, I have to give you back. But at whatever age it is, and obviously pretty young, Moses goes to Pharaoh's house. He is raised in the very household of the man who intended his death. And God has this amazing sense of humor. Like he flips things. If you go back and read just all these stories, like even let's do the death of Jesus, which we'll get to in a little bit. In Deuteronomy, it says anyone who is raised upon a, on, on a tree is cursed. 
And yet what you have with Jesus, he's put on a tree, or tree right over here, a green tree, and he's put up on that tree. He is cursed, but in his cursing, he takes the highest role in the entire universe. And you see that over and over. And here in the very household of evil, Moses is going to be raised for good. So there are these parallels. Parallels between the birth of Moses and then parallels between, of, of the birth of Jesus that we want to look at. Here's the first one. Both Moses and Jesus were descendants of Abraham. I tried to get pictures that were as realistic as possible. They're both Jew, we would say they're both Jewish. They're both Israelites. They're both children of the promise. They're both descendants of Jacob, the tribe of Levi. You remember what the Levites do later? What's their job? Remember what they do in the temple? Aaron, the brother of Moses, is going to be the high priest. They're the priest in the temple. So he's from that tribe. And then the tribe of Judah. Who are there? Who's the, who's the most famous Judite? Jesus. When in doubt, you say Jesus. They're the tribe of the kings. And so here we have one born of the tribe of the, of the future priest, one born of the tribe of the future kings. They're both descendants of Abraham. Jesus is a descendant of Abraham on his father's side, Joseph, and on his mother's side, Mary. Here's the second one. A king ordered the death of Moses and of Jesus. So Pharaoh gives out this decree. Every baby needs to be thrown into the Nile. King Herod, sitting on his throne in Jerusalem, he's a half Jew. He's always paranoid. He's ready to run at any minute. In fact, he builds a couple forts that are ways for him to escape if he has to. And he's there in Jerusalem, and these astrologers from the east, probably Persia, show up. It'd be a whole horde of them. We say these three kings of Orientar, but they're, they, because they have three gifts, but there's probably just so many people. They had to have their army. They had to have their attendants. They probably brought their families, and they'd been on the road for over a year, and they come to Jerusalem, and they go to Herod, and it says the entire city's in an uproar because these guys show up, and they go to Herod, and they say, we have a question for you, Herod. Where is the one going to be born who will be king over Israel? Herod has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And so he gathers all his religious types, experts of the law, and they say, in Bethlehem. And then he tells these astrologers, go find this baby and worship, and when you're done, come back to me so that I can worship as well. It's a seven-mile trip about from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the astrologers, the magi, the wise men, whatever you want to call them, they leave, they go, they, they find Jesus now living in a house with his mother. They give the gifts, and they have a dream that said, don't go back. Don't go back to Herod. And they leave by another way. And Herod realizes he's been duped. And he sends troops to Bethlehem. And he murders every boy under the age of two. A king orders the death of Moses and Jesus. They both should have died. Like, neither one of them should have had a story to tell at all, humanly speaking. And yet, here's the third reason, the third connection. God protected both Moses and Jesus in Egypt. How did God protect Moses? He moved him into the very house of the person who wanted to kill him. He, he, God connected Jesus with the one person who Pharaoh probably would not take the baby from. Of all the people that could hide this baby anywhere in the country, this was the safest place to be in the very room with Pharaoh. And with Jesus, if you remember the story, Matthew 2, an angel appears to Joseph after the Magi leave and says, get up. Take your child and his mother and go to Egypt and stay there till I tell you because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took his child, the mother. During the night, they left for Egypt and they stayed there until the death of Herod. So it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son, a prophecy from Jeremiah 31. 
Both children, both men, both boys should have died, and yet not protected in Israel, in the promised land. They're protected in a very place where you would think they would not be protected at all. Why? Because God protected them. Which leads to the fourth. Moses grew up as the grandson of a god, and Jesus was the son of God. In Egypt, you would worship the pharaohs. Pharaoh simply is another term for king. Uh, they thought they were the manifestation of amun Re. And so when you were coronated as Pharaoh, the leader of the country, you became the representative of this God, you became divine, and every year as you celebrated your coronation, it was reinstated or restated that you were divine, and you carried at least these three names, King of the Gods, Lord of Heaven, Lord of the Thrones of the Two Lands. Imagine what a mess Herod would, uh, Pharaoh would be to live with. Yo, honey, will you go cut the grass? Do you know who you're talking to? I'm the Lord of the heavens. And so he grows up the grandson of a God. And Jesus, in Luke 1.35, as Gabriel appears to Moses, uh, I'm getting all these names mixed up, to Mary, says this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, speaking to Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. God is God, and Jesus is his Son. So we've got these comparisons, and people will sometimes say, well, isn't that cute? Isn't it kind of nice that you can make these comparisons? But you know they're not really there. I mean, you're reading into the text uh, none of this stuff really belongs there. I went to a school where, that just totally rejected this. And they said anyone who goes to the Old Testament and reads back into it anything from the New Testament is doing something incredibly wrong. What you do is you read the, New Te- the Old Testament and just let it stand, and then the New Testament is something separate, and the two should never meet. But the gospel writers... And the early church disagreed completely. Matthew and Luke, as they wrote their stories, they wrote their stories to make Jesus, to make it clear how Jesus related to Moses. But they didn't make it up. Those connections were there. All they did was draw them out. And where did they get that? They got that from the early church. From the earliest days of Christianity, right after Jesus resurrected, the church began to spread stories about Jesus, and this sort of stuff was what they spread. And where did they get that? From Jesus himself. You go back to Luke 24, and he's talking to these disciples on the way to Emmaus, and he says to them, from Moses on, it's all talking about me. He's saying from the earliest chapters of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, I am the subject. And where did Jesus get that from? Well, he's the son of God. And as God, he recognized that the revelation of God written for this people had included in the very midst of it the story of Jesus. There were such compelling similarities the early Christians saw, and we see that they could not be missed. Now, the question is, why are they so important? Why does it matter that Jesus is written to look like Moses? Who cares? Moses died, I don't know, 1,500 years before Jesus. Like, who cares? Any answers? Like, why does it matter? Here's why. The early church was convinced that Jesus was the new Moses, and in being the new Moses, Jesus would complete what Moses started. So Moses, we're going to see, was a prophet of God, And Jesus then is going to carry this on to completion. Everything Moses indicated God would do, Jesus did. So we want to look at two ways in which Jesus fulfilled the ministry of Moses. But first, we want to look at a verse, some verses. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses is about to leave this second generation of Israelites who have come out of captivity. The first generation's all dead, except for Joshua and Caleb. And they're on the edge of the Jordan River. And on the other side is Jericho. And they're scared to death. 
and they're not sure they can trust God. And the spies years earlier had said, you can't do this, you can't take these people. And they're petrified because Moses is going to leave them. And then Moses comes to them and he speaks to them. And he says this, the nations you will dispossess, dis- dispossess. Listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. Hear the, see the next two words? Like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And then God said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, referring to Moses, from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. So do not be alarmed. Here's what Moses says. Verse 14, God doesn't want you to be idolaters like the other nations. Therefore, I'm going to raise up a prophet. This is Moses speaking, who's going to be like me. He's going to be one of you. He's going to be an Israelite. And you must listen to him. And then he quotes God, and God says, I have the same thing. I'm going to raise up this prophet. He's going to be from your people. I will put my words in his mouth. This one will tell you what I tell him. Verse 19, and anyone who doesn't listen to him will be accountable before me. And then in 21, Moses concludes, and you'll know who this is, because everything he says will come true. So what's going on is they've compared the birth of Jesus to the birth of Moses, and now they're saying, we're going to see that Jesus fulfills the ministry of Moses. Why? Because he is this prophet. That's the argument they're making. And so Moses, after he's an adult, after he's a leader, right before he's about to die, says, look for this prophet, look for this prophet. And these New Testament writers see Jesus and they say, he's the prophet. In John 6, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. And everybody is astounded. It's right before he goes and walks on the water. And when the the miracle is over, after the people, they see what Jesus has done. They saw the sign Jesus performed. And they began to say, surely this is the prophet. The New Testament writers want you to know that the the, the Jews in the time of Jesus recognized that he was Moses' successor. He was the prophet like Moses. And then in Acts... Peter and John are near the temple and they heal a guy who's lame and a crowd begins to gather and they enter into the temple and there they sit in Solomon's colonnades and Peter begins to speak to them and here's part of what he says. For Moses said, the Lord your God, he's speaking about Jesus, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from the people. Here's what he says. Their births are similar. Their births are similar because their missions are going to be similar. As Moses was the prophet from God and nobody like him, so Jesus is the prophet of God and there's nobody like him. And so now we ask the second question. How does Jesus fulfill the ministry of Moses? Like, what did he do to complete what Moses had begun? There are so many things that Jesus does. Again, if you go back and you read the story, you'll see Jesus does this and this and this and this. I can show you the link to pink stuff, and he'll, he has so many. He'll keep you going for months. But there's two we want to look at that I think are the, main, the, the most essential. And here they are. As Moses led the people through the Red Sea, he delivered them from slavery to freedom, from death to life. And then secondly, in setting up the bloody sacrificial system, Moses made it possible for a rebellious people to have an enduring relationship with the holy God. Here's the two things that Moses does. When he takes them out of Israel, he takes them through the Red Sea. You know that story, right? One of the schools, again, I went to, remember we say the Red Sea, they pass through, the the, the waters recede, they go through the middle, the Egyptians try to follow, they get swallowed up and killed. One of the schools I went to said, well, it didn't really happen because the Red Sea is only this steep. You know the problem with that one, right? Now you got to get all the Egyptian army somehow drowning in water this deep. So they've just reverse engineered the miracle. He leads them through the Red Sea from slavery to freedom. And he sets up this sacrificial system. Let's look at these real quickly. 
the Red Sea, the Israelites had come out of Egypt and they were squirrely. The Egyptian army is still alive and they're making their way. And it says they just kind of meandered. And then God had them stop and he had them stop in the most inopportune place right on the edge of the Red Sea. Come on, God, can't you do something else? And so they're camped here and they turn around and look and in the distance they see dust. It's a desert. If you ever look at a map and you see before you get to the, the, the Nile sort of crescent, it's just all desert. And they see the dust rising up and they know it means just one thing. The Egyptian army is coming after them. And they're scared. And they cry out to God. And God says to Moses, hey, don't worry. He says, relax. It's a Hebrew word. Take your staff, your pole, and dip it into the water and watch what I will do. And Moses, the man of faith, does this. And you've seen the old Ten Commandments movie where the jello separates. Man, it separates. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? Like, what did it look like? Like, was the water still churning? Could you reach in and, and catch a fish? Uh, I, I have no idea, but, it, but a wind blew. And as the wind blew, this thing opened up. And the Israelites walked through. And the Egyptians died. What's going on in this picture? Here's the picture. As Moses leads the people, he leads them into the water and to a sure death. Like, when's the last time you crossed through a sea. They enter into this, convinced that at any moment these waters would just crush them. And so what they, what they do in obeying Moses and Moses in obeying God is they march to the end of their lives. And they enter thinking, we're never going to get out of here. This is it. It's been nice to know you. I didn't really like you that much anyway, but here we go. And so they make their way through this and then how's the story end? They make their way out. You see what that's a picture of? Death and life. When they're on this side, they are still slaves. They're out of the country, but guess who's after them? The Egyptians. And they're like, oh, they're gonna take us and boy, are they gonna be mad. They've done that before. Later on, they said, I wish we could go back to Egypt. I wish we could, at least they were kind to us. They weren't kind to them. But man, they didn't want to die. And so they're standing there and they're slaves and they think like slaves and they're scared to death and they go through and as the water crushes the Egyptian army, they on the other side are now free. And what do they have to look forward to? The promised land. But the only way they could get there was through the death and the new life that came through the waters. You see that picture? Now we do the second one. God had made a covenant with these people. I will be your God. You will be my people. There was one problem. How does a holy God live among a really rebellious bunch of people? If you got a kid that's out of control, what do you do? You ground them forever. What you ought to do is put a door there and close the door. I've seen parents who were so angry at their children, they took their doors off, which seems sort of backwards to me. Here's a God who is holy. Here's a people who are not. And so God, in his kindness, took Moses up on the hill and he showed them this covenant. Here's how we're going to live together. And here's what my nature's like. And here's how we're gonna deal with your sin. And they put together this sacrificial system. If you want fun reading, go read the book of Leviticus. Oh my gosh, these poor people. Like I figured in the book of Leviticus, you, there's these certain sins and you, there, there, there are sacrifices and usually they're bloody sacrifices prescribed for different sins. I figured I'd be there like every day. Yo, I'm back, I'm back, it's me again. And so he sets this up, this bloody sacrificial system and now the wrath of God was put at bay. That's the good news. The bad news is this. The blood of animals cannot bring forgiveness. It's just simply an IOU. 
you owe MasterCard $2,000 and you can pay the minimum. Oh, next month you owe $2,200 and you can pay the minimum. And you never pay the thing off because you're just paying the minimum and these sacrifices were simply the minimum. And now we turn to Jesus. Moses leads them through the Red Sea from death to life. Moses sets up a bloody sacrificial system which at least holds off the wrath of God. Could God just have forgiven sins? We've talked about this before. He can't because of his character. He is just. He demands payment for everything. That's a good thing, but it's a hard deal to live with. And then comes Jesus. And Jesus is going to fulfill these two items. We're going to start at number two, and we're going to work to number one. How did Jesus take care of the bloody sacrificial system? The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews, one of the greatest books ever written, next to the places we'll go. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more than will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. The blood, you look good. You are clean enough to come into worship, but it had nothing to do with your hearts. You're still a rebel. And then the most important one, Hebrews 10.10, 10, and we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once. Once and for all. What did Jesus do? He became the sacrifice. On the cross, cursed on that tree, as we said, he faced the wrath of God that was ours. And as he faced that wrath, I know you know this story, but it's just so overwhelming. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. And he said, it is finished. That is, I have done it. Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial system that Moses had inaugurated. And then the second one. As Moses led the people through the Red Sea, he delivered them from slavery, from death to life. What did Jesus do? His Red Sea event was his death and his resurrection. Four times in the New Testament, the death of Jesus is described as a baptism of death. Look at this from Romans. Paul says this, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried. So in baptism, if you're a good Baptist and you get dunked, Ping! You are taken under, and it's a sign of your death, death to sin. And you are raised to a new life. It's a beautiful picture. You're buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, we too may live a new life. Jesus was baptized into death. And at garden, the garden, he says, Father, if there's any other way, as he's looking towards entering the Red Sea, entering the death, being covered with the waters of death. Father, is there any other way but not my will but yours be done? As Moses enters into the waters to die, so Jesus enters into the waters to die. As Moses brings the people out in victory, so Jesus brings us out in victory. It's the resurrection of Jesus. And so Jesus completes this ministry of Moses the Red Sea, he completes it by dying and rising again so that we might move from bondage to freedom. Why are you free? Your sins have been paid for in the death of Jesus, and they have been stamped as gone because of his resurrection. Can you imagine if Jesus died and that was it? And we say, oh, he loved us. Look how he loved us. He died. But if he didn't rise from the dead, what good is it? And here, the story is that like Moses, he came out of the waters to new life so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ah, isn't that amazing? 
So the birth of Jesus, there's these comparisons. Why are these comparisons? So that we can see that he is the prophet that was promised by Moses. Why does he need to be the prophet? So that he can take care of our sin at the cross. So that he can move us from death to life. And as the Israelites were marching to the promised land, guess where we are going? And so the final part, what do we do with this? Like the application is already there. But I'm going to pick out three applications, one about God, one about Jesus, and one about us. Now, if you're the kind of person who has to read everything first, have at it. Like some of you will never read that at all, and then others of you have already finished. And now you're reading it again to see if I put my commas in the right place. There's no periods, and I did that on purpose, and I actually debated whether I needed to put periods or not. Here's the first one. Let's talk about God. There's never been a time when the, external, the eternal redemptive plan of God was not centered on Jesus and focused on you. That sounds awfully selfish. That's biblical. I grew up in a tradition that said Jesus was a last ditch effort by God to save humanity. So Adam and Eve were put in the garden. Surely with all that they had, they would remain faithful. They didn't. And so God then moved among the Israelites and made a covenant with them and showed them his love and redeemed them and the great works of God would keep them in line and it didn't. And then God says, well, I'm kind of out of trump cards. Hey, Jesus, you willing to go? And Jesus said, yeah, I'll do it. And then Jesus dies. And the problem with that, with that view is one, it's not biblical But secondly, what it does is it leaves all the impetus with us. Jesus died, and theoretically, nobody could accept him. The Bible makes it clear that from all of eternity, Jesus was the plan. Have you ever noticed that good movies really tell the story of Jesus? Do you know the, 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 uh, what's called the, the hero's journey? And the hero's journey is put together, and, and all it does is describe good literature, good, good movies, and all of them have this story where a guy comes and he faces all this temptation, and, and bad looks like they're going to win. That's why when you see fight scenes, the, the first good hit is always by the bad guy. The good guy never gets, the good guy never comes and just knocks him out, and it's over. The bad guy always wins, and it looks like the, the good guy is in trouble, and he can barely move, or she can barely move. And then the last minute, they get up, and boom, and they win, because it's the story of Jesus. And so, so interwoven or woven into our, our very fabric as people is this story of Jesus. I read a story this week of a lady, and her grandmother had just died, and her grandmother used to wear this locket. And she used to ask her grandmother, what's in the locket? You know, what's a picture of? And the grandmother would say, oh, somebody I loved very much. That's all she ever told her. And so this little grew up, little girl grew up with her mom with this locket. And then her grandmother died. And she got the locket. And she wondered, like, do I open it? Is it sort of, is, am, I, am I somehow being unkind to my grandmother? Shouldn't I kind of keep her secret a secret? But she was so intrigued. Who did, who, who did my grandmother love that much? And so she got the locket and she opened it. And, and the article said it was very difficult to open it, open it. And as she opened it, thinking it might be a picture of her late grandfather, maybe a picture of her mother when she was young, maybe even a picture of her. And she opened it. And there in black and white was a crinkled picture of a cat. Someone who had meant very, very much to her. Don't you think all of us just want someone who loves us? Like, isn't that the goal? You get married thinking, oh, here's one person in my world who's going to love me. Yes, but you have children and say, oh, they're going to adore me. And then they become teenagers. You do things where you're actually serving humanity and you think, oh, people are going to say, you're all right. And they say, you're not all right. But what we find is not only has the eternal plan of God been centered on Jesus, Jesus is focused on us. From morning to night, Jesus thinks about you. 
If you had a t-shirt, it would have your picture on it. In his locket, there's a crinkly black and white picture of you. Jesus loves me, this I know. I was thinking through who in my life has really loved me. There have been some people. There are some people. But you know the, the song, nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. Nobody loves us like Jesus. And nobody has gone as far as Jesus has gone to show us how much he loves us. Isn't it weird to think about having a relationship to Jesus? Like, I've never seen him. I mean, maybe I had. Maybe he was in the, you know, the Publix the other day, and I just didn't recognize him. He's got a body. He's somewhere. What's he look like? Where is he? And yet, we're called to have this relationship with him. How do I know I have a relationship with him? I'll tell you how. Every once in a while, there's something that just clicks. I don't know how to, I don't know how to put it. Uh, I, I don't, you know, there's not a message that drops from heaven other than scripture. I'll read it, and sometimes it speaks to my soul. Sometimes I'm with somebody, and they speak to my soul. Sometimes I'm by myself, and I get this peace that just passes, as they say, all understanding. And I said, Jesus is present. He loves me. And it seems like God confirms for us that our eternal redeemer, Jesus, loves us, and he's focused on us. In third grade, Mrs. Kraut told us not to point because when you do this, three fingers are coming back at you. It's supposed to keep you from being poorly behaved. It did not work with our third graders. But I'm going to point. You and you and you and you and way back, my people in the back. You left my seat open. There you are. You're one ahead. Look at that. Did you get to church at time, on time at least? Good, 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 good. When you're in the back row, it's usually because you got here late. And so you got all of you. Let's get on this side. There's got to be a couple of you over here that Jesus loves as well. We can do the double shot. You, you, Jesus. You, 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 Jesus loves you. Isn't that remarkable? And he loves you. He's not looking at you said, I'd love you if. He just loves you. Oh, here's the second one. Talk about this all day. Now about Jesus. In his death and resurrection, Jesus has opened an avenue from spiritual death to spiritual life. When I was in college, I had a 1968 VW Bug, greatest car in the world. My friends and I used to get in my car on Fridays and drive. Where were we going? We had absolutely no idea. It took five bucks to fill up the car, and we would just drive. Where are you going to stop? I don't know. We haven't figured that part out yet. When I was in seminary a couple years later, I had a 1981 Volkswagen Rabbit. I thought I had arrived. It had a sunroof and everything. And we did the same thing. Load up friends. We were up in Chicago now. And we just head west up to Wisconsin, over to Minnesota. Where are you going? We don't know yet. We'll tell you when we get there. But Jesus had a road map. From the day he was born to the day he resurrected, he knew where he was going. Where he was going was to talk to people about who he was. And once he heard Peter's confession, you are the Christ, he made his way back to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he crossed over the Red Sea in death and life. And you know what he's done for us? He's opened up the avenue for us. Isn't it nice to go somewhere and someone's already told you what it's like? Sometimes they don't quite tell you the truth and you get there and you think, Oof, this is horrible. Can I get my money back? But other times, if they've told you and you trust them, you're like, ah, oh, Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. He's been there and back. And as they say, he has the T-shirt. Jesus has opened up a path for us. Do you know Jesus? You're alive. You say, well, I'm not so good. No, you're alive. You've gone through the death. You've come through the resurrection with Jesus. You're alive with him. You've been changed, and you are on. You are marching with him as he's taking you to the promised land. Johnny Cash has that song, There Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold My Body Down. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna rise up out of the ground. Jesus sang that song. 
And we get to sing that song as well. And then finally, almost done here, us. We can move from mistrust of God to trust. I have decided that I fundamentally mistrust God. And I fundamentally mistrust God because I grew up in a world that told me that God was fundamentally not able to be trusted. I read an article on brainwashing this week. And what they said is if you can get people young enough and you can scare them enough with lies and lies, eventually when you tell them the truth, they still aren't going to believe the truth because they've got so much of the bad stuff. And so I find that when, when God says he loves me, I think he loves me, but, but what, what, you know, what's the little print? Like, what, what's happening? And then I find when things happen that I am not really happy about, I think, uh-oh, I knew this was going to happen. So I started here in July of last year. Jerry, are you in here? I mean, Jim, Jim, where's Jim? I'm Jerry. Jim was in here earlier. Now, some of you, I may have told this story. I, it's my favorite thing so far. I came on July, uh, July 1st to start my job. Came to that front gate, and Jim was there. And it's vacation Bible school. And he says, yes, may I help you? And I said, yeah, my name's Jerry. I think I work here. He said, well, who are you gonna go see? I don't know. I had no idea. I'd met Scott once. We'd had breakfast together. And I'd seen him, but he always ignored me because, you know, he is official. Um, he said, uh, uh, well, what's your job? I said, I have absolutely no idea. He wouldn't let me in. I had a backpack, and he says, he looked at me and said, you fit the description. Thanks, Jerry. Hey, Jim, appreciate that. And I, I congratulate him, because that was actually the right thing to do. I was on the outside looking in, and yet with God's love for us through Jesus, we're on the inside Looking out. Brennan Manning is a book, Ragamuffin Gospel. If you've never read it, we just did part of it in the seminary. And if you ever want to be part of any of our classes, you're always invited. We meet Monday nights, we meet Thursdays. But here's what he says Too many of us live in the house of fear, and we don't live in the house of love. Man, I'm working on it. You say you're working on it. I, I know theology. I've been a Christian, I think, a long time, but it's still viscerally very difficult for me. To trust God. If I was here and God said, lean back all the way, I'd have to check and say, but you have no body. How are you going to catch me? I just don't trust him. And what he says, if you live in the house of fear, here's, there are two reasons why. One, you haven't totally understood the finished work of the redeeming death of Jesus. He said, you don't understand Christ. And then he said something else. And the second one is, you're just proud. When I was a pastor, um, people used to come and tell me their sins and nothing would surprise me. And I would always tell them, God's forgiven you, God's forgiven you, God loves you, God's forgiven you, Jesus died for you. And then when I deal with my own sins, I'd think, yeah, but Jesus doesn't forgive me. It wasn't because I thought I was a worse sinner, it was because I was proud, pride, proudful and didn't think I could sin like that. And when it hit me, I didn't know what to do with it. Um, last week in chapel over at PGA, little eighth grade Bella, Corey and I were talking to the kids, and we said, fundamentally, what was wrong with Adam? And she gave the most precise, theologically correct answer. Adam wanted to be his own God. That's me. If God's not trustworthy, who can I trust? I can trust me. But if I look at my track record, I see where my trust of myself has gotten. And Jesus comes along, and the Father comes along and says, I will take care of you. You are my child. Brendan Manning puts it this way. We need a new kind of relationship with the Father that drives out fear and mistrust and anxiety and guilt. When you feel those, those are choices we're making that I'm making because I'm a rebel at heart still. It permits us to be hopeful and joyous, trusting and compassionate. We have to be converted from the bad news to the good news, from expecting nothing to expecting something. So the birth of Moses points us to Jesus. The birth of Moses and the birth of Jesus points to the connection as prophets. Jesus as the prophet like Moses completes Moses, what Moses began. In dying, he took care of our sins once and for all. In crossing from death to life, he guaranteed that our future is secure and for all of eternity, we will be with the Father. 
And because of that, the plan has always been about Jesus and focused on you. Because of that, we have the avenue. We know where to go. We know where to walk to go from death to life. And because of that, we can move from mistrust to trust. Pretty cool. I wish I had a good joke to tell you, but I don't. So let's pray.